All right. Um, I don't know if we're supposed to get started yet, but yeah, 2.31, let's get started. Um, so my name is Michael Wong. Um, many of you guys know me. If you don't know me, hi. Um, this is me. I've been in this business for probably about 20, 25 years doing things like, and in the last, 20, last 15 years or so, I've been doing a lot of research into heterogeneous programming. Primarily in my role as the OpenMP CEO, I guided OpenMP towards accelerator support. Um, then, and then I decided I was done with that because I now want to bring that to C++ because ultimately that is always my first love. And I've been in the C++ committee for quite some time. So yes, um, um, a lot of these slides is, I want to acknowledge the fact that um, <coughs> they come from some committee members, help from a lot of people, help from my staff, um, especially I want to name Gordon Brown, um, one of my staff who's been writing a lot of these, um, these slides in his, in, as he's bringing these talks. Um, there are still probably errors. I want to make it clear that any errors that remain are theirs, not mine. Because they did, they wrote, they did all the work. <laughs> no, honestly, they are still mine. Um, and of course, there's the usual company disclaimer. Um, I now work at Coldplay, which is a Scottish company. And we specialize, and the reason I was drawn to Coldplay was because they specialize in working on heterogeneous computing in C++. Okay, in Clang, so they actually um, hosted a Clang LLVM conference, which I think is coming here next week. I actually attended the one in Edinburgh, and I asked, well, what does Coldplay do? <laughs> that was actually, and that was about three years ago, I think, or four years ago. Four. Yeah, and, um, they, and, then, and then when they told me what they were doing, that's kind of tweaked me into thinking about, um, you know, doing, doing this stuff more full time for C++. So they do have tools. Um, I won't get into that because there's a lot to talk about. I probably will not get through. I have a tendency of basically over-preparing because I have, I have a lot of things I, can, I want to talk about. But I will hit, hit the key points. Um, one of the things that I want to impress on you is because I do have a fairly, um, I have a broad view and a deep view of parallelism, concurrency, heterogeneous computing. I want to impress on you the idea of using the proper abstractions um, for different things. Um, I'm going to talk about why there's a rush to massive parallelism today, and it probably won't, it, it isn't a fad, it's not going to end anytime soon. And what, and necessarily for an audience at ACCU, it depends, depending on your depth, um, I need to go over what is heterogeneous computing, what are the fundamental technical problems we need to solve. Some of you guys may not be fully aware of that. And I dare say, um, bringing this to the C++ standard committee, which is what, what I'm doing now, like I said yesterday, I'm trying to change the world, but doing it incrementally. Um, it means that I'm trying to expose this to possibly, um, I would say about 70% of the people in the C++ committee don't know or don't care that much about heterogeneous computing. I would like to quote something from John Lakos. He says, he says a couple of years ago, <laughs> when I was a committee member, and he was trying to convince me to accept um, um, the, the Bloomberg allocators, he says, well, you, you need this, you just don't know you need this right now, so you should vote for it. <laughs> I thought that was a great quote. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that quote. You're gonna need this, you just, if, you have not, if you have, you're not using it right now, you just don't know you need this right now yet. <laughs> okay, and of course, um, the, the SQL C++ language, I'm now the chair of SQL, which is the heterogeneous C++ programming language from Kronos. Um, I'm not particularly partial to it, I think it's a great, it's a great beginning, but there are so many others, and we're trying to bring the features of that to C++, ISO C++ standard. Okay, so I'm also a member of the directions group, being one of the older people now. <laughs> it's amazing when I stand up here and just to be able to, to claim that, and now I'm being annoyed by the young people with their great, brilliant ideas. Like I was at one point, about 15 years ago, I know how, that was, that's how annoying I was. <laughs> So we wrote this document, P0939, for the direction of ISO C++ group. It's one that I implore you to read carefully. I'm extracting parts of it that, that is important for you to take a look at. Um, and some of the discussion yesterday made me think, I really should highlight some of these things. What is C++? And specifically, I like to highlight the fact that C++ supports building resource-constrained application and software architecture. And as we lead down into this rat hole, you're gonna see that, so how do we want C++ to develop? Well, it improves support for large, and there's a bunch of things, but ideal, and most importantly, I think that it improves support for high-level concurrency models and simplified language use. And then finally, um, we claim that C++ rests on two pillars, that it is a direct map to hardware, which came initially to, from C. 
There are, in section 4.3, there are concrete suggestions. Um, we talked about it. That's exactly where we identified pattern matching. There was a question yesterday asking, you know, should we add pattern matching to C++? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Um, exception and error return, static reflection, modern networking. And about two thirds of the way down, you see modern hardware. We need better support for modern hardware, such as executors, execution context, affinity support for C++, leading to heterogeneous distributed computing support. Other things like SIMD, task blocks, more concurrence, concurrency data structures, improved atomics memory model, um, lock-free programming structures. The challenge is to turn this incomplete laundry list into a coherent set of facilities and to introduce them in a manner that leaves each new standard with a coherent, subs coherent subset of our ideal. Okay? So that is really opening the door towards um, where we need to take C++. So you might be confused given all the hardware out there and all the different software abstractions now that's in C++ and outside of C++, what you should use for parallelism and concurrency. Okay? To my knowledge, this is probably one of the first tables out there, and I kind of built this over the last couple of months as I was giving talks various places. Um, and partly because I do have a view across the world beyond C++, being in, involved in OpenMP, OpenACC, and now Sickle. I've been talking to a lot to the other guys who are talking about this. So if you're programming cores um, today, it's undoubtedly C++ 11, 14, 17 threads. Async is a, a, a weak child at best to support that. It's essentially a thread abstraction in an object model framework. Okay, so it emulates threads almost exactly, and therein lies some of its flaws. It's, it's blocking, okay. Hardware threads is very much the same, and if you want to do vectors these days, you have to use parallelism TS2, okay, which, is, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about the progress of. Um, you could also do vectors in OpenMP or Intel, okay. All the, all the vendor-specific um, compilers have, vector, have essentially vector support but they don't support vectors from other people's machines. So therein lies the problem. Eventually, you want to get it into this, this um, parallelism TS, which eventually will progress. And you'll see this chart again and again as we move along, because I'm going to show you what I think will be uh, in C20 and beyond with this chart. Okay, so remember this well. Um, I've also been involved deeply in atomic fences, lock-free futures, counters. I recently worked a lot on, um, oh, did I just, uh, did I just kill something? I take a bit of my time. All right, I think you need this. So the other thing that, um, um, a, a, well, I was recently involved in hazard pointers as well too. That is used partly in atomics and concurrency, oops, spelling mistakes there, TS1, and transactional, me transactional memory TS1, okay? That's where you have to do, where you have to do interaction with different kinds of threads or, or objects. Finally, if you want to do parallel loops, um, you're going to have to use um, a, a bastard form of async, okay, or TBB's parallel invoke, or parallelism TS1, and C17 parallel algorithms, okay. Um, of course, you could also use OpenMP, okay, OpenACC. Any of those can do parallel loops fairly, very, in fact, that's what they specialize in, except they don't, they might, and I actually added iterator support into OpenMP, but that's not to say it's still perfect. Because if you put any kind of complicated iterators in OpenMP, it probably will not recognize it well. If you want to do heterogeneous offload with, FP or with uh, GPUs and FPGAs or GPGPUs these days, even your regular Intels have these, uh, Xeons have uh, GPGPUs, have, have a part of the circuitry uh, devoted to um, GPUs. All the AMDs have, AT have, um, have GPUs in them. They're integrated. You might want to use something like OpenCL or Sickle or HSA, or OpenMP, ACC. There's also a whole bunch of languages from the national labs called Cocos and Rajas, which you might not know about, but they're mostly runtime support. And they're not going to come out of the national labs, but they are also working to inject them into the C++ standard. If you want to do distributed computing these days, today, you're basically down to something like H. If you want to do it specifically in C++, Oh, sorry, I might want to mention, if you want to do it specifically in C++, SICL will do it, um, and to some extent, then HSA, I think yesterday's talk mentioned some of that with HCC, C++ compiler. Cocos and Roger is my recommendation. I don't recommend the other ones because they're not C++ specific enough. 
for you to get anything that's heavily templatized to work in, a, in, an, in an offload situation. If you're doing distributed computing, traditionally there's always been MPI, but I wouldn't recommend that for C++, obviously. Um, the abstraction is heavily C and Fortran based, uh, using communicators, and, and, and the, the one I would recommend is HPX, which has, a which has a very, very deep C++ foundations for distributed node computing. Finally, what's there to attend to things like caches and numas? Well, we don't. We don't have anything. C++ does not have anything to attend to things like that. Other, other, um, other um, paradigms have attended to those fairly well, like OpenMP has. Um, but in future, right now, we're working on things like executors, execution context, and affinity, okay? So that you can now potentially address the nearness and farness of certain resources and the fact that there's a latency constraint that you might want to address for the highest performance possible. And then the last two I put in there, because they are not necessarily abstractions, but they are a problem, okay? If you wanted to do anything with thread local storage, um, which has traditionally been done using either like GCC thread local storage or the thread local underscore local keywords from C++ 11, which essentially allows you to create this, 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 this side thread which lasts, persists through the length of the program, okay? That, but it's a local storage. Um, you can do that, but if you ever bring in GPUs or anything like that, that's gonna be a massive problem because now you've got thousands of these little GPU cores. Is each one of them gonna start up a TLS thread? And if you do that, are you gonna convoy this, the, the initialization of these in, in a, in a, in a, serially? These are massive problems we have to solve. So we are working on something called EATLS. It's not exactly a nod to electronic arts, okay? But we thought EATLS is better than um, ALS, which is agent local storage. It's also the name of a disease. The other one, the other problem we need to solve is something called exception handling in a concurrent environment. Exception handling really only works in a sequential environment. You can't even have two exceptions in flight at any particular time. This is a problem because what in a concurrent environment, how do you deal with that? And we discovered this actually during part of the, the parallelism TS discussion. When you have parallel algorithms happening, what happened if there are exceptions in flight from different parts of the algorithm? We, it was so bad we had to strike it out of, the, C of, out of the, the, the parallelism TS at the last moment and basically resort to saying it just all terminate. It, it will just terminate if any, at any time if you have more than one, um, if you have any exception as a matter of fact coming out. Now that's an okay solution, but it's not the best solution. So we need to do better. So we're also working on a, a paper right now called exception handling reduction, which means that it's giving you theoretically the idea of taking a reduction function, applying to multiple re exceptions. You tell me what the reduction um, uh, criteria is, and it will try to reduce that so that ultimately only one comes out, okay? So pretty, it's a sound idea, it's well researched. It's not particularly um, you know, out there in any way. So you have to remember two things from this talk. You have just remember that you, when you're dealing in heterogeneous computing, expose more parallelism and increase the locality of reference. I'm gonna come back to this over and over again. So why the rush? This is a, just a kind of motherhood apple pie in case you haven't figure, have figured it out. I'm not gonna, I used to spend a lot more on this section, almost 15 slides. Now I've dropped it down to about three slides. The things that I used to be involved, I've pretty much been involved in, in um, high, all the way for high performance computing in my early 20 part of my, my career. Now more towards embedded computings with embedded chips that uses GPUs um, for self-driving self, for self cars. So I can say categorically that across the, across the spectrum, there is now a drive towards heterogeneous computing. Um, in the high performance domain, there was this drive for what's called um, exascale computing. That's 10 to the 18 flops. And what this um, chart, and you will have seen this everywhere, it's from the supercomputing, which is supercomputing 500 um, um, uh, conf um, um, chart, which usually re is released at the supercomputing conference. It basically charts the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Now I know that most of you guys would not have your hand on one of these things. We're talking about these multi-billion dollar installation with 256,000 cores okay, um, that are used to compute things like galaxies, uh, collisions, all, all, um, all the way down to, you know, how to store your, your, your atomic nuclear pile safely so that it doesn't leak out in the ground and things like that, okay. Um, the important thing to note is that 
This is bracketed by two things. Um, this is the march toward 10 to the 18. And this, was, this is an old chart. I haven't replaced it. Bad on me. 2014. Um, the real important one is this mid middle one. This is the top 500, the top supercomputer, the 500 supercomputers. Okay? And it's been just basically inching up. The the, um, this purple, this blue one, is the, the speed of the sum of all 500 supercomputers. So you can see that the top one pretty much dominates most, contributed almost 90% to that speed. Okay. I'm not going to worry too much about the yellow one here. So what are the top 500 ones? I actually worked on many of these ones in the early part of my career when I was at IBM. This was the Sequoia computer, supercomputer at Lawrence Livermore. It's no longer even close to the top anymore these days. It was top like about 10 years ago. And the reason it's no longer to go to the top is because it has no GPUs. It was designed in the era when GPU was not an important thing. Today, the top one is this one it's from the Chinese. Um, they have something called the Tianhe 2 or something like that. I can't remember the name anyway. I think it's, T, it's, it's the Breath of Heaven um, version 2. And it uses um, Intel Xeon Phi's, and it's programmed using OpenMP. <laughs> this one from Oak Ridge is called Titan, and it's programmed using, in, it's, it's got Intel chips married to NVIDIA chips. Okay? These are now practically right up there at the top supercomputers right now. On the other end of the, the scale, you also have these supercomputers in your hand. These little cell phones, these little um, bright squares in your face are nothing less, uh, less than supercomputers now. If you are doing anything with self-driving cars, they are basically supercomputers on wheel. Because what they're doing, I mean, just think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to recognize pedestrians, traffic, bicycles, street signs at a high enough, fast enough speed that you could actually react to, that the computer can actually react to. Okay. There's no computer program in the world that can, that can predict all of these things. What they do is they use machine learning. Okay? With, it, with a proper training and an inference engine calculation, then you can predictably do enough of these. One thing that a, a friend of mine told me is the way they simulate all these real world possibilities, not to drive a car all across the world, although you could, they actually run a car in a game program, in a game program, night and day, night and day, that simulates real world. So that's, I'm sorry, that's actually how they do it. And you wonder why the recent Tesla and Uber has crashes. But hey, um, there's also uh, internet delivery. Um, our company is involved with a lot of these things, especially with self-driving cars. But they are also requiring the GPU to accelerate the various aspects of the computation of the kernels. Okay. And then finally, I put this slide in because people said my, my talks are not colorful enough. It has actually nothing to do with, actually it does. It's a game program. <laughs> and it details, I forget what this one is. It's the USS Albany from the Wargaming's World of Warships. Is that right, Guy? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a nod to the games programmers because ultimately heterogeneous, I always say the games programmers pushes our boundary faster than anyone in the world. OK, maybe other than porn, I guess. But, yeah. <laughs> but really, it's the games programmers that drives the graphics, the computation engines, pretty much everything. Okay? And heterogeneous computing came out of the requirement of SG14 talking to the games programmers, saying that they need heterogeneous computing. They need to be able to control affinity. They need to be able to control placement threads in order for them to be happy with C++. Otherwise, C++ has a death sentence in front of it. And I said that yesterday, actually. So what now? All right, what now is that we take a look at the number of pages in all these different specifications that tries to help um, um, heterogeneous computing. You see that C++ 17 is now going to be is almost 1,500 pages. Um, C99 to C11 it didn't increase a whole lot. Um, OpenMP kind of doubled, and OpenCL didn't really change a whole lot. Um, that's a lot of stuff being put in for C++, C, um, and OpenMP. But is any of it heterogeneous computing? No. C++ only right now works in CPU domain. Okay? It thinks that there's a flat memory apps app address space out there. It doesn't even th know that you have caches it doesn't even know you have different kinds of latency. Okay? So how is, it, how is it still so workable? It's because 
often, it, I, often uh, you guys make it work, or we have to re drop out of C++ and go to some other language to get the best performance. That's unfortunate in my view, because I can see this coming. I saw it when I started looking at some weather stuff from uh, at, uh, when I was at uh, ECMWF and at uh, UK Met Office when I was involved. A lot of the, 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 the surrounding utility functions were done in C++. But you know what the kernel is done in for the weather calculation stuff? It's all Fortran. Yeah, thank you. Are you in, involved in weather stuff? It's because they do not want to move that to C++, partly because, number one, it's so well computed, it's got no bugs anymore, we hope. <laughs> okay? And because it's predictable in terms of the actual calculation that they can do. Okay? I do not want to see that for I do not want to see that in future for heterogeneous computing, where you have to drop out of C++ and use CUDA, as good as that is, or OpenCL, or even SQL for that matter. Although I think SQL will contribute to the, to the evolution of C++, I do not want to see C++ um, be dropped out of in the key thing. So how are we doing it? Well, this is how we're doing it right now. And it's invisible in here, because nowhere in here are you going to see heterogeneous computing. We have, um, these are the TS plans. Um, you have the red stuff that is now out there right now, which is parallel algorithms on the, con on the parallelism side, which has execution agents and progress guarantees. You have the blue stuff, which is saying what's coming in C20. And I'm gonna tell you right now what, what, is, what we did decide on in the last C++ standard meeting at Jacksonville. We have database parallelism, task-based parallelism, and loop-based execution policies. There's some stuff in the long term we'll want to add, like map reduce and pipelines. And in here are some of the machine learning policies that we can do. Okay. I'm the editor of the concurrency TS, and in here we are just monkeying around and just tearing this thing apart back and forth. We're trying to add futures, executors, which we ended up moving out into a separate TS. Okay. Um, Things like resumable functions, await, log-free programming techniques, synchronics, uh, which now becomes a, an atomic flag, um, atomic views, latches and barriers, and atomic smart pointers. None of this, by the way, made it into C++ 17. Sad, but good reasons. But we have things like coroutines and networking as a separate TS, and actually I was, I'm transactional memory also as a separate TS as well, too. Last time I came to ACCU, I came to talk about transactional memory. Since then, it's kind of fallen out a fad. Okay, I hate to say. Um, so in Jacksonville, we moved the parallelism TS2 into Jacksonville. TS1, as you recall, has parallel algorithms, and it already went to 17 at the last moment, ripped out a bunch of stuff. Okay, I have a talk about all the stuff that they ripped out. Some of the other people in here also have talks about that anyway. We added SIMT, this used to be DataPaw, okay? And we added the VEC loop-based execution policy. So just to, you might not be familiar with these, ex these new execution policies, so let me use this chance to review them with you. You're probably familiar with what's called, what we have right now in the, in the parallel um, algorithm, uh, TS, TS1, basically, and C++17. So this is actually C++17. Everything on the left side of this graph is in C++17. You have par unsequenced, which is really vectorized, if you can. It's unsequenced, because you can try to do it all together you know, in parallel on multiple vector lanes. So it's unsequenced. You have par, which means you try to do it in parallel. If you have enough cores, you can try to do it in parallel. Okay? These are mostly for embarrassingly parallel situations. Okay? And then finally, you have sequential, which is the, un this was the defaulted old C++ parallel, I mean, sorry, STL, okay? What's coming, what was in the parallelism TS was something called unsequence and VEC, okay? Um, they are specifically for loop-based execution, pol uh, loop execution policies. Um, and so, what is going on there is that here, we're now moving on to a bigger picture on the execution policy. You see, old style SIMD units have overlapped executions in contrast to modern SIMD uh, units, uh, which has lockstep executions. So this difference affects the way the compiler supports these things. Um, so the policy is a description of the code, okay? And we wanna use the description, the policy as a tuning uh, hook. Unseek, it's basically a single-threaded version of par parallel vector, parallel unseek, okay? It's mathematically parallel with no interdependency between the iterations. 
at all. It differs from parallel um, in that it has restrictions from, from different iterations of the loop. Um, as long as there's no mutex or atomics, then unseek can be more efficient than par. Okay. I'm fairly familiar with this because when we do vector, when we do parallel, when we do SIMD the parallelization, when I was still um, in my previous job, and I'm sure the games programmer knows a lot about this because they use vectorized um, code a lot, is that you can't just um, parallelize um, any particular uh, SIMD executions because what if one calculation depends on something that comes from a, a different previous calculation, and that different calculation is done on a different thread? How do you know it's going to be all ready in time, right? If there's no dependency, that's what's called embarrassingly parallel. You just basically can blast through everything in parallel as fast as you can. That's really the best scenario, okay? So the worst scenario is VEC, which is, um, this is probably the most interesting because it's called a vectorized execution. This gives you what's called classic vector loop execution. It applies only for four loops and for four loops that's strident, okay? And the ordering between different iterations of the same loop, it's a sort, okay? You don't know the order of the callback um, functions, so you can't take advantage of any vectoring ordering. Um, so let me just show you what some of these mean. So if you have some, like, something like a Cray or, or controlled data, I used to work, I started my career in controlled data. Um, you have these long vector machines, and, these, and, and they might have, you know, step I plus one can begin at or before step AI, okay? And you might have a vector architecture that's today's more modern SIMD architecture like the x86 AVX or ARM Neon or when I was at IBM, it was UltraVec, okay? So these long machines have a pipeline and arithmetic units that gets reused and at the same time as main code that moves into the next instructions. So before you finish A0, you can start on A1. And when A0 is finished, it moves on to B0 on long pipeline vector machines. And some of the length can be arbitrary. The modern uses for wide registers that hold more than one value at a time. Um, the, and they can do multiple uh, step at once in pre-decided chunks. So you can get something like two times more floats and doubles in these registers, for instance. And the difference between this and the vector data proposal is that the loops hide this and treats each, par each of these partial register as a separate lane. So if A0 and A2 grabs the same mutex at once, which they will likely deadlock, okay? So you want to avoid synchronization. Um, you could also do this whole thing in software using software pipelining. You can begin issuing B0 until A0 is done. You can begin issuing A2 while A0 is, do, is, is starting. You can handle a, a, um, A again because the instruction is freed up. So you can, before the, and you can do that before the next iteration and, bef and before the end of the current iter iteration. Now, we don't have a pipeline proposal yet in C++, but we will. Daniel Garcia and I would like to work on something that allows you to do um, pipelining, okay? So, with wave, what, so what is in common among all these machines is that what we can capitalize on is what's called a wavefront, okay? Which is a sequence of instructions and guarantee. That is a somewhat predictable wavefront. There's no early applic application, no earlier applications can fall behind a later application. And you enable now forward dependency for vectorized code and auto-vectorized code, okay? So this is what the VEC policy gives you, and this is important. So I've, to demonstrate this, I wanted to show you what a wavefront looks like. It, all, it really is essentially a wavefront of instructions being executed, okay? And it works for long vector machines. It works for your, your, your vectorized architectures, okay? And it also works for software pipelining, okay? And effectively, if you were to look at vectorized code, um, VEC lives in this area, that it's, it's loops that works with um, vector semantics, okay? Whereas sequence, whereas unsequent is the most liberal. It's, it, it lives, it, these are loops that work with unsequent semantics. There's no particular dependencies here, okay? But in sequence, because of these inverted UI plus one, but it depends on VJ plus VI plus one, you need a sequential execution in order to get this, in order to get the valid results out of here, right? So, what, so what I'm gonna tell you, and then there's also this one other thing called no vec, which means that you don't wanna vectorize anything. Um, it used to be called vec off. It took me a long time to realize why they changed the name to no vec. Just try saying vec off really fast and with a foreign accent and you'll get it. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so what are we, what's heading in the C++ 20? In the last, in the Jacksonville meeting, we got this stuff that's heading. The rest is not that inter is in interesting, but the one I want to point you to is VEC. We this, oh sorry, uh, the um, unsequence, sorry, the unsequence policy is going directly into C++ 20. So that's this guy here. Sorry. This top one, loops that work pretty straightforward what unsequence semantics is going straight into C++ 20. Because it's so obvious and so simple, everyone knows how to do this. We don't need a parallelism TS2 to work through it. What we didn't, so what is actually still left over is, so is, is VEC. VEC is staying in the, in the TS so that it can be experimented with, okay? Um, there is also this log jam happening. Um, recall how concept is required as, a, as a required because now if you want to get ranges, you need concepts, although they created range V3, which has no concepts in it. And I won't go into that too much, but anyway. Trust me, there's a lot of um, soap opera stories in the C++ stand. I'm sure Marshall knows us quite a few. So in the parallelism world of C++, there's a whole, there's a log jam coming as well too. Executors is something that is the foundation. It's a found, it's gonna be found, you're gonna hear, you're gonna be hearing about executors for years and years. I think there's a talk here. I chair the group that is essentially trying to um, discuss it. We had a call last night at 10 p.m. actually, that's why I left the, I had to leave the thing and then get on this call. I would just say that think of executors as giving you a way to marry multiple um, parallel uh, constructs with mating it with multiple parallel uh, resources. So you can use a parallel loop with SIMD units as a resource or with an OpenMP runtime as a resource. That way you don't have to create a parallel loop for every one of the resource. Without executors, you would end up having to do that. Just like without algorithms and containers and iterators in between, you would have to have an algorithm for every container. We don't have that because iterators nicely solve that problem. Executors would do the same thing. But behind executors, there's a whole, whole backlog of, of things trying to use executors as a fundamental basis. Some of it predates executors and they have to be retrofitted to work with executors, like networking. There are other things like futures. We have futures in the futures, t um, sorry, in the concurrency TS, but it's really a single consumer, single producer pairing, okay? It does not recognize the ability for multiple producers pairing to a single, sorry, multiple cons producers to a single consumer or the other way around. People would like more from futures, and so we have actually decided to not put full push forward the current set of futures in the concurrency TS into the C++20, even though they're well experimented by Microsoft. They're basically based on Microsoft futures. Um, this futures will lead the ability to get to the next async, a better async, because async has this traditional problem in that it's blocking. In a parallel, in a concurrent world, anything that's blocking is not nice, okay? So that's, dependent on executors. Networking, I already said, is being recasted. Um, algorithm policy extensions, we'll have to add more algorithm policy, execution policies. You just saw a whole bunch of them that's being added by loop-based executions. We don't think cold routine is that dependent on executors, okay? But there's a, an opinion that executor has to merge into the IS before networking does. Almost a unanimous opinion there, okay? So the, the, the end result of that discussion was that there's two possible outcomes. One is that we could um, take in IS-20 immediately some form of executors with net networking as a minimum baseline. And the other one is to move to delay everything until IS-23. So in order for us to achieve heterogeneous programming um, um, in the future, um, we have to figure out a way to um, bring together all these pieces. I mentioned in the, in the past, I mentioned before that I want to change the world, but inc incrementally in steps, because that's the only way C++ standard will allow you to do that. So vectors, this parallelism TS is now out for vote by, for the national bodies. That's right, Daniel, you have to vote. <laughs> I'm, I'm supporting it. 
But most likely, it will go into C++20, which means that you will get vectors, okay? That's one of the big steps towards GPU. Because even while you have vectors in CPU, it's really the vectors on GPUs that make it go really, really blazingly fast as well, okay? And there's a way to do that on GPUs because in this specification, there's an ABI parameter at the very end of all the vector SIMD types, that, and that ABI parameter allows you to plug in GPU um, capabilities, okay? If you don't use it, it's all purely for CPUs. You've got a whole bunch of things that gives you concurrency support for negotiating with other threads and other tasks, what to, what to do, things like atomic fences, lock-free futures counters, and transactional memory, okay? That will probably, that will end up in concurrency TS1, and that will probably go into C++20. I think we still have enough time for it. It's going to, I know, I know, one other thing being Marshall, the unbearable lightness of being Marshall is that he's at the end of this long pipeline of things, and he's the last to see it, right? And I have to implement it all. So when these big, big, big uh, proposals land um, to, in Marshall's lab, it's basically on the last day of the C++20, okay? <laughs> that's your, that's, that is your lot in life. I really, that's why I owe Marshall a great thanks, because he always gets, gets it through. You know, oh, here's a 200-page specification. You got to get it done today. Okay. It's not the first time he's done it. <laughs> now he's regretting attending this talk. <laughs> it's bringing back bad memories, huh, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, that's coming. Concurrency TS1 is going to contain um, hazard pointers, um, better way of doing um, lock-free programming, um, concurrent data structures, um, more changes to atomics and fences. Okay. Um, in fact, I'm going to request that we review hazard pointers at the, at the Rappersville meeting because it's kind of got through LEWG and now it has to. Yeah. You see how this stuff goes? We just keep pushing it down. Parallel loops, as I said, <coughs> is in um, a, a, um, async TBB parallel. Um, it's just using C17 parallel algorithms. It's already kind of there. Okay. Um, if you want to do heterogeneous computing, we now are working on the proposals for affinity for P0796. And distributed is also in this. Hold on. Now, you might be looking at this, and now it's getting a little bit puzzled. This is usually when, I, when people start losing um, the track of the talk. You're like, why is a, this doing affinity? Because shouldn't you be doing affinity here, one for caches and numas? Yes, you're right. Affinity traditionally is dealing with, uh, with, with caches and numas. But the C++ standard has said that, given, uh, given us guidance, where they said, with these unaccessible memory right now, like memory that's on a GPU or distributed node, we don't want to break the entire abstract machine and the memory model to deal with them right now. Can you deal with them as a form of affinity? Meaning, effectively, they're just distance, further distance away, okay, than your normal cores, things that are on die, on die and things like that, right? So that's why we're doing it here. Instead of a separate something, we did put, propose a bunch of things on data movements and things like that, but they didn't get through. Go ahead. Yeah. I think that if you call that topology, mm -hmm. suddenly the problem goes away because there's no confusion with cash. And actually, what we really, really want is the topology of the system. So, so the, the comment is that that's exactly what we're doing. If you pull the topology, suddenly the caches kind of disappears and, and gets subsumed underneath. And that is the rationale that why, why we agree to do it this way. Okay, and this proposal is actually um, getting quite far along now. We've done it two or three times now, and as somebody mentioned yesterday, don't be surprised if you get, you, you get to R13 before your proposal is accepted. Some of mine got almost up to R, R10 or R12. Um, caches and NUMA, to some extent, will now be de dealt with using the executor TS um, or IS, um, and then the but also now dealt with using affinity as well, too. Then you have thread local storage, which is now being casted into what's called execution agent thread local storage, because GPU thread local has a much smaller stack size to deal with than CPU when you have like maybe a megabyte. You might be get a couple of hundred kilobytes at best, if even that, on a GPU. So there's a proposal now that we just had a call last week to talk about um, how to recast TLS with what's called age execution agent local storage. And then we also are talking about how to handle exception in a concurrent environment using a form of reductions. So that's my vision of C++20, um, where it's going with parallelism and concurrency. 
And for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about um, heterogeneous programming. Um, some of this will be low level, some of this will be surprising, but let's see how that goes. So one of the things that started this was in the previous Jacksonville a meeting in 2016, we made a massive presentation to full committee about the need for, parallel, for heterogeneous programming. And effectively, because this was something that SG14 really, really wanted. And effectively, they gave us a go ahead to explore this, this space, okay? So what is it? Well, it's about gaining performance through the utilization of systems which makes use of more than one kind of processors, each of which specialize cap with specialized capabilities. So why should you care? Well, it is everywhere, and it is driving the technology of the future. When I started with heterogeneous programming, I thought maybe this is a drop in the, one of these um, fad, like, you know, I don't know, like Facebook or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, it just. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, here to st it's here to stay, because it's, it's, it's in movies, it's in uh, telecommunications, cars, okay? So basically, what I would like you to, take, you to take away from today is a vision of the future of heterogeneous programming, but in modern C++. Because heterogeneous programming has been explored already in many, many languages, honestly. It's not really that new anymore. We've practiced inventing the language, designing it. I've been involved with at least two, at least three, actually. Okay, we had, I did OpenMP, I did the, the PlayStation when it was at IBM, we had using DMA as transfers for the various different power PC cores, that was at the very, very low level, and increasingly we designed it to get to a higher and higher level. And this is actually kind of almost like my fourth go around at trying to design. But I really want to design it for C++, because I really would hurt if C++ does not have it. And so, how do we get there? And we're going to talk about what are the, 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 the challenges, what are the fundamental problems. Believe me, it's actually always the same ones, okay, across the different designs. I'm going to talk about sickle, we have time, and the future of where this is going. So, so let's start with a bit of history. Um, this is the where the movie comes in. So 1999, you have single core, and we were enjoying pretty much steady performance gains using Moore's Law. And the principle that the number of transistors on CPU, that basically doubles every year, and you get the free lunch and so forth. Okay, and then in 2001, we pretty much had um, the free lunch was over, and we had a wall in CPU performance, and CPU stopped going faster. We had to start looking for other ways for gain to gain performance. Um, shortly after that, we have multi cores on the same chip, gaining performance using running on multiple cores in parallel. Okay, people just were looking for various ways to sidestep to get this um, free lunch back. The heterogeneous era, in some way, I would claim starts in 2007. It's kind of hard to narrow this exact day, but it pretty much became evident that the performance gains from additional adding CPU cores would not continue providing steady performance gain, nor would it keep Moore's Law um, happy. So there are some devices that have more than four cores, and there are some applications that can take advantage of them. It was pretty much found that the general limit before seeing diminishing return was about four cores, okay? And shortly after that, we had CUDA 1.0. 2008, um, OpenCL 1.0 was ratified to OpenCL to kind of say, you know, at that time, people were running around with their hair on fire saying OpenCL is going to save the world. I've been through too many of these now in my career to, to really believe in these kinds of hypes anymore. And of course, DirectX, um, because a lot of this was usually for graphics. At that time, you know, it was like how templates became more than just templates. It became metaprogramming. Back then, this was just viewed as something cool for graphics. OpenCL, CUDA was great for graphics. They didn't realize that this had massive compute capabilities. If you focus a lot of the compute engine onto the graphics, uh, the graphics <laughs> capability. And the reason it's able to do all that is because it's all about massive parallelism throughput using the SIMD units that's on, that are on there, okay? 2011, AMD announced the first, the, announced the first range of APUs. APU um, um, is a word that means that the CPU and the GPU is integrated onto the, on the single chip, as opposed to the, the discrete GPUs that NVIDIA would give you, for instance, okay? So now I started getting involved in all this stuff. I was the CEO of OpenMP, and it was going along nicely until four OpenMP members broke out and said, hey, we're forming our own specification. Well, that's great. <laughs> Why did you do that? 
<laughs> Why didn't you develop it in OpenMP? <laughs> There's a lot of reasons back and forth. I was very diplomatic about it. But OpenACC branched off from OpenMP to support offloading to accelerators. At the time, OpenMP, just like C++, still is, only supported CPU parallelism. In 2012, I'm sorry, going back, what did I say? In 2012, Altera announced OpenCL support for FPGAs, okay? By 2013, OpenMP finally got um, support for offloading. It took them about um, six years, actually, um, to get everything working, okay? And then by 2016, HSA 1.0 was ratified. This is the heterogeneous system architecture. AMD gathered a bunch of um, embedded developers, and it's similar to OpenCL, but it's much lower level. It's meant to be an engine that allows you to support various um, other forms, and it's more focused on de defining requirements for heterogeneous devices. That's how we got here. This is the, so you can almost effectively separate out into the single core, multi-core, and then finally the heterogeneous era. And undoubtedly, we are now firmly in that heterogeneous era. So there are fundamental challenges that are always difficult. We had to, we, I met every one of them when I was doing the PlayStation for IBM, um, that would open MP, then would open ACC, then would um, um, C++. And it's always to, to these four. Performance portability, um, heterogeneous offloading, expressing that parallelism, data locality, and movement. If you ask those four questions, every time you look at a, a heterogeneous design, you, will, you wouldn't be far off, and you will probably be considered some kind of an expert. So don't ask those questions. <laughs> Is it possible to get performance portability across different devices? Imagine you write some code today, and you want to change the GPU from an NVIDIA GPU to an AMD GPU. Are you going to get the same performance? From that this differs from functional portability, which you're kind of probably very familiar with, like this is what C++ gives you and C gives you, functional portability. Performance portability promises the same performance or close to within 10%, they say, if you move, if you move the devices. This is a really hard problem, as you can imagine. <laughs> Okay, because there's a lot of heterogeneous devices. If you think there were a lot of compilers before, there's a lot more heterogeneous devices. Okay, and in fact, I dare say the number of compilers is dwindling, okay, because of the dominant uh, capabilities of Clang and, and uh, GCC. And I claim that's actually a bad thing, okay. But this stuff is not, down, this stuff is not decreasing. You have accelerators, like a C on fire, you have CPUs, um, you have GPUs, um, like NVIDIA's G4s, you have these Xilinx, Altex, FPGAs, which are reconfigurable computing. Okay, if you're in finance, this is big, because in order to get the highest performance speed, you actually want to do everything in hardware as much as possible. Okay? You have the AMD Fusion chips. These are the APUs with integrated CPU and GPUs together. And of course, the digital signal processors, like the stuff from Texas Instrument that powers music, video graphics, and things like that. And each of these architecture is different. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can kind of look at it and say, wow, they are really different. <laughs> some have hierarchical memory architectures. Some have higher memory bandwidth. Some have little bits of um, local memory for each particular um, programming, program execution devices. Okay? And then they all coalesce into a cache before they head into global memory. Some have low power demands. If you're driving a self-driving car, you kind of don't want an NVIDIA big giant you know, thing in there because it's going to suck up most of your power demand. You want a low power device in there, right? Okay. And an FPGA uses these cross-link architectures for you to essentially enable and disable different links so that you can have essentially your own um, 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 computation units for addition, subtraction, as you need them, okay? You tell, you tell me what's best for, and this is usually best for things like data parallel streaming and image processing, and it's ideal for low power. And your typical DSP architecture is mostly about um, a purpose-built compute engine that's just there to do um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in the ALU, in with a, inside the ALU units. Very low latency on a chip and low power consumption, okay? 
I personally think it's not possible. But that's probably because I would, I've, I've seen so much of it that, that it's, um, I, I, I just can't imagine the challenge being solved. There's a lot of people who disagree with me on this. They have, they're working actively to prove me wrong, and I hope they succeed. What they're trying to do, like I said, is they want that to get that performance portable. And you'll see that, and I'm involved in a lot of conference journals in this regard, that almost every conference will be saying performance portability on this, performance portability on that. In fact, I'm guilty of writing a few papers, of, a few of those papers myself, trying to argue for it. But in reality, secretly, I've always wondered if it's actually even possible. Because the architectures fundamentally are just so different. I've since taken a much more holistic view, and I've used this at other keynotes where I've given, where I look at it not as um, an individual problem itself, I look at it as part of three um, iron triangles of uh, language design. Um, and part of that is because I've been involved with it so long, I see this over and over again. It's, all, it's about the one missing ingredient that most people don't think about is portability. Oh, no, sorry, uh, productivity. Okay. If you, just like if you are the, a team lead of a team or senior manager, you have to you know, do some sort of scheduling with your team and, oh sorry, with your design. With, let's say you're doing, designing a project and you have, um, what do you have? You have resources, you have, um, you have time, okay? And, um, and these form some of your constraints. I think the third one is resource, time, and, um, sorry? Money. Thank you, money, thank you. Thank you. I, I haven't been a team lead in a long time, so that's like, and I, you know. And you know that you cannot optimize on all three. Because if you could, you'd be a genius, and you would run the world. You always have to trade off one of those for the other two. Resource, time, and if you want to optimize on those, you better spend, you gotta, you better spend a, a gob load of money, okay? If you don't have enough money, you gotta cut on resource and time in some way. Well, when you're designing a language, believe it or not, you get the same thing. You, have, you can try to optimize for performance or portability or productivity, but you will not get all three. And if you try to optimize on performance and portability, I started noticing that you're going to cut yourself short on productivity, meaning how productive that, that language is going to be. I'll give you just exactly one example. I've, I've often brought this out as a punchline. What is the most successful parallel programming language out there? It's not C++, it's not OpenMP, it's not any of your favorites. But if you're in database, you would know the answer. It's SQL, yeah. And I didn't tell you what successful means because in my definition, successful is millions of people using it without having to really learn programming language and be able to productively get results out of it. Your definition of success might say it's performance or you might focus only on portability. But if you are a senior enough manager who's looking at, at it from a broad point of view, I would argue that there's no other more successful language than SQL. You don't have to be a parallel programming expert to get a lot of, out of these queries. And because it's so good at productivity, it necessarily isn't that great at performance or portability, okay? Languages that are great on these, these other aspects are not going to be that great on, these, on, on, on some of these other ones. And I have another talk, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that. But that's essentially what I wanted to say, is that these things affect each other as you're designing the quality of your language. Okay. So maybe there is a way, but we have to, if there is a way to solve this performance portability, I started thinking, effectively fitting these guys into a, square, um, a round peg into a square hole. You have to think about all these problems like heterogeneous offloading. So how can we offload code to a heterogeneous device? And the way we do it is that we look at the C++ compilation model, okay? It's pretty easy. You have some source files, some compilers, generally an object, some linkers, generates an ISA, goes to an x86 CPU, okay? Now, for, if you want to program GPUs, well, how do you do it? You can do it two ways. You can either have the GPU as a separate source or you can have the GPU code as part of the, the, the host code, which is called single source, okay? And I've worked with both, actually. So as a separate source, well, that's pretty easy. That's what OpenCL does, okay? It has um, the kernel as a separate piece of code, then the main code, okay? 
And the way it does this is that you have just some device source which goes with some sort of device compiler which goes to the <coughs> GPU, okay? If you have a single source compilation, I'm gonna use C++ AMP as an example. I've studied all of these, obviously. And they essentially integrate the computation for the GPU in this, essentially this kernel code here, okay? And now you have basically one C++ source file which contains a device code, but it would go through a separate device compiler which generates some IR, and the linker's job is to bind the IR and the CPU's object file together into a x86 ISA, which has embedded device IR objects, okay? And now it knows how to dispatch out some parts of it to CPUs and some parts of it to GPUs. We now pretty much have settled that single source is better. Why? You can get effective type checking that you couldn't normally get um, in a separate source. Because in a separate source, you could effectively have any type on the, on the separate compiler, separate, separate compilation path. Just like on translation, un translation unit, you would never know if it's a different type. Without type checking, you would never be able to enable these generic programming patterns that we desperately need for C++. Um, you can allow compile time evaluation of device code, okay, as opposed to runtime evaluation, okay. <coughs> you now also don't need to distribute the source code. The next one is describing finding the parallelism in your, your, your heterogeneous programming language. There are many different ways. Um, I kind of distill them into three ways. There's directive based versus explicit parallelism. There's task versus data parallelism. And there's queuing versus stream-based parallelism. I'm gonna look at all the different languages and how they support them. So if you're in OpenMP and OpenACC, that is obviously the best example of the directive-based parallelism. It uses these Palm Pragma OMP, or if you're ACC, it's Palm Pragma ACC. These par pragmas essentially effectively takes regular C++ code and changes them to say, I want this loop to be done in parallel. It was a fantastic addition because it's, it's, it means that you can retrofit parallelism in. But if you think about it, it's got a lot of problems. I have no idea with this single pragma, where in my, what um, execution resource am I using? Okay. I've conflated a lot of constraints in there, a lot of intentions in there in this single parallel, in this pragma. Um, another thing while I was doing OpenMP was that if I want to do um, error detection, I have no way of actually identifying where the error is in this following code when I'm processing the pragma. I, I, so as a result, a lot of OpenMP code misses a lot of error messages. It wouldn't even tell you because there's just no way for the compiler to associate this a, 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 a problem in here with some problems in the following construct. It's, you might say, well, it's not really a, a candidate anyway. We, none of us like pragmas, and that's also true. Um, we, I spent a lot of time trying to make OpenMP look really good for C++, and at the end of the day, I kind of just gave up and just said, you know what? Um, I could make it the most, I could make it support every C++ construct using pragmas, but nobody's gonna come and use it for C++. It's a okay, case so where you will build it, but no one will show up. You could also use, you could also get the parallelism using what's called explicit parallelism, and that's mostly what the CUDA, SICKO, um, TBB, Fiber, C++11 threads do. And they have basically an API that's used to explicitly enqueue one or more threads. I use C++ AMP as an example. Okay, they have a parallel for each, okay, which essentially um, directs you to um, execute this in a for each statement, okay, um, using an index and, oh, there's this restrict keyword. What is that all about? Well, C++M invented this thing called restrict, which essentially kind of um, tells you that um, there's some things you can't use in this inside this kernel. Back and to put this in context, C++ AMP was invented or, or designed a long time of, in today's world, practically a long time ago, really only five years. And back then, you really couldn't, the GPUs of those days couldn't really do some of the crazy things like virtual functions and things like that, okay? So this is effectively um, restricting it to say you can't have some normal C++ things like complicated virtual functions and dispatches in there, 
Okay. Today, this, is, this, this discrepancy is narrowing that many GPUs can do very much the same thing as CPUs now. It's still not quite the same. So I would argue that this restrict keyword should go the way of the dodo bird. It really should no longer be there. The other thing that you would separate the parallelism out is what's called data and task-based parallel. And this is, these are pretty obvious ones. Um, when you have um, um, task-based parallelism, you would have something like um, a way to dis distribute task, which are irregular um, compila compilation units. You see, loops and for loops have basically regular compilation units with very regular workload. What if you have one workload this big and another workload this big and you want to parallelize those? How do you, how do you chunk up the scheduling so that it's still fair? This is a problem that we worked on and know how to solve. Well, you use tasks, okay? And OpenMP, TBB all have task-based capabilities, okay? You could also do data parallelism, which is the most obvious. This is the SIMD capabilities, where you have effectively have multiple thousands, millions of SIMD lanes, and take a, a large piece of data, and as long as you're using the same operation on them, you could effectively just blast it out to these millions of SIMD lanes and get just embarrassingly parallel uh, capability, unless there's dependency um, or anti-dependencies in from one from one computation loop to another. That's why that remember I talked about that vector loop based execution policy. That's what that is specifically there to solve. Okay, if you have no dependency, that's really the best part. All right, and that's what these CUDAs things where they create a CUDA malloc and then you do a vector add for the 64 by 64 of these ABCs. Add is easy. I mean, it's probably pretty much not going to depend on anything. But once you get into any more complicated calculation, it will. I often um, um, compare this to you guys flying on a plane, which many of you guys do, I did coming here. And it's great if you were on a plane and everybody eats at the same time. Actually, you, actually they do eat at the same time. No, if you, everyone goes to the bathroom at the same time, that's what, it, that's what this really means. SIMD execution is basically telling everybody to go to the bathroom at the same time. There's only one problem. There's only one or three bathrooms on the plane that I came over on. You actually need thousands of bathrooms for this to actually um, to get, the, get the, the parallelism that you want. The other one is using what's called queue and stream execution. Okay? And one side uses a, have the functions that are placed in a queue and then they're executed once per enqueuer. This way, it allows you to essentially, um, so, um, so AMP, CUDA, SQL, C++, 17 are all using the somewhat queuing model. And then the stream-based execution, which is more useful for FPGAs, um, what you have is essentially a function that's executed on a continuous loop of stream data, okay? And Brook GPU is using something like that. That's the second problem. The third problem, data locality and reference. This is by far the biggest limiting factor in heterogeneous computing, is the cost of data movement in terms of time and power. In the OpenMP specification, nearly two thirds of the specification was dealing with how to do data movement, how to move the data from the CPU to the GPU, GPU back to the CPU, or maybe update it on the GPU in case you don't want to totally move things back and forth. The reason is because it can take a lot of time. It could be a considerable amount of bandwidth, depending on whether it's a discrete or an integrated system. Okay? And your calculation, you better believe that your computation is worth it on the GPU before you move it over. If your computation is not that big in the first place, that data movement is going to totally swamp your computation. And you have to move it to the right places because devices have, different, have memory that is nowhere nearly as straightforward as CPUs. They have hierarchies, they have caches, they have local memory, okay? This is a, from a talk from Bill Daly from NVIDIA in 2010, where it basically is based on the NVIDIA GPU and demonstrates essentially the contrast between the cost of arithmetic operations and the cost of data movement. A lot of heterogeneous devices are limited by their power consumption so having high power consumptions can also um, greatly reduce performance. And what he's basically doing is saying um, the fetch operation costs more than computing on them. And for different kinds of data movement, um, there's different kinds of energy costs. Okay. 
So how do you move data from the CPU to a GPU? Well, you can design it like this. You can have implicit or, 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 or explicit data movement. You can tell it to do it or just imply that you need it there. Implicit data movement is how SQL and C++ AMP does it. Um, data is basically moved to the device implicitly um, using um, data structures, okay? There's no instruction that says move this to the GPU. It's all hidden in here, okay? It tells you, to, it tells the runtime that I need that data over there whenever you schedule this computation, okay? You do it hopefully in the best performing way possible because you know what that GPU is. Explicit is OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP. They use these CUDA malloc, then they use memcopy to move it, okay, from the host to the device. Hey, listen, you can't get more explicit than this. I don't even, you don't, you don't even know CUDA to, know, to be able to understand exactly what this is doing. This is very clear and understandable. But just imagine you have hundreds of thousands of data movement, okay? And when is the best time to move it there? This is exactly how OpenMP does it with pragmas, okay? That's why I see very little life in that kind of future. I'm not saying that these are not useful. In fact, for C++, I kind of think we need both because the library implementers want this but you as the users want this model, right? You want this to implement this. So how do you address memory between host CPU and device? How much time do I have? Um, I'm, oh, actually, are you guys bored of me yet? <laughs> um, very complicated. Right now, we, all, we think of the world as a, as a flat world. We thought about, we were like that about three or 400 years ago. <laughs> but we know it's not the world. The world is full of structures, and it's round, and it's got hierarchies. And so we have multiple address space. We have non-coherent single address space and cache coherent um, single address space. Multiple address space is like SQL, AMP. OpenCL, CUDA, pointers have keywords or structures for representing different address spaces. And they, this gives you very fine control over where the data is stored, but, you, but things need to be defined explicitly. Non-coherent single address space is supported by um, the, presumably the next version of SQL because OpenCL 2.0 supports it. It's supported by HSA and CUDA 4. Well, pointers have a Pointer address address a shared address space that's mapped between devices. That's pretty cool. You effectively can share the address space between the CPU and, and, and the device code. Okay? And it allows host CPU and device to access the same address. But it requires this mapping. Okay? This invariably translates into a kind of a time delay and a performance, C, performance problem. I think um, Alex got a question yesterday talking about the HMM capability for Linux, where there's now automatic mapping Okay, between CPUs and GPUs, and that's, that's really great. And you might wonder, well, with that capability, do I even need any of this? The answer is yes, because that automatic mapping, if affected by the OS, effectively is gonna cost you something. It's not, nothing is here is for free, okay? It's great and convenient as an app, higher abstraction, and we, we love it, but it doesn't make this unnecessary. You also have things that are called cache coherent single address space, and that's also in HSA, SQL, OpenCL, CUDA 6. We'll point to address a shared address space, um, and it, what it, but improving on this, it allows you to have concurrent access on whole CPU and device, but it can be inefficient for very large data, okay? So this is the, this is the, this, these are all the problems that you generally have to solve. There are lots of other ones. I don't want to get through them yet, um, but we need to solve at least these four problems before we even, move, even think about moving on. But they're not hard to solve. They have been solved. We just have to look at um, the trade-offs and how uh, each one is, um, is, is best for C++. Before I move on, I think there's some questions, so let's do those. Alex.
Yes, that's right. It doesn't do pointers across boundary. So I should probably, it's not really multiple address space, it's really single. Yeah, they totally, so that's another one of the restrict things. They're totally banned pointers, so that's how they. You had single interaction pointers, but they were inside the panel. So you yeah. Didn't take that. Yeah. You used the radio array for everything, so I, I guess. Good. Weird. It is in that weird space. <laughs> Other questions, discussions? All right. So how do we do heterogeneous programming today in modern C++? Okay, this is one way, it's not, the only, it's not the only way, but it's one of the ways that's available to a lot of people because it's commercial. There is a downloadable thing that you can get that's free um, that would support Intel and AMD. But um, we, we make money by, by, by building it for specialized GPUs and, and self-driving car devices that people throw at us, okay? Um, it's right now part of OpenCL, which is based on this Kronos thing, but it has ambitions for m merging itself into C++, ISO C++ as much as possible. And being the chair of that, I can certainly direct some of that direction. One of the unfortunate things with a lot of the um, heterogeneous programming languages I work with is when they claim that they work with C++, it's only <coughs> to a certain degree. Meaning they, they, they work, but they won't work well if you use any kind of major template libraries or virtual functions or anything like that. The goal of Sickle is that it can be used with pretty much it's modern C++ exactly as is, okay? And to do that, it basically had to have a, have a design that is basically on C++ 11, 14, and 17. So Sick, the entire Sickle, Sickle um, um, the SQL ecosystem works because it can now use, you can have any C++ application using some C++ template, um, and it would go through the SQL um, OpenCL language, generate underneath the OpenCL um, engine right now because it's now paired to OpenCL, but it doesn't have to be. It could be SQL for HSA, for Vulkan, um, generating compute graphics languages for OpenMP. It's just that this is the pedigree, that's all. And because of the OpenCL, you act, each of these devices comes with these things called ICDs, which does the, does the translation from OpenCL IR into the actual machine code that's efficient for that GPU. So as a result, you can translate it for, for all of these things. There's an ICD for Intel uh, CPUs, GPUs, uh, AMDs, for NVIDIAs. Um, but one of the mess that they're having is that each of these ICDs progress at different rates. Some vendors hold back these ICD as they advance, so that's just commercialism, but they all have it. So that's one of the reasons why you have this theoretical performance portability model that allows you to go through a single language and now can be applied to any of these GPUs or accelerators. So how does Sickle work to, to improve offload and performance portability? Well, it does it because it's entirely standard C++. Um, as I said, it compiles to this intermediate language called Spear, which then generates out into any of these particular devices. And then you can use um, a multiple, single, multiple compilation and a single source model. This is a really intricate word, and it means more things than you think. Multi-compilation, multi single source model. You already know what single source means. It means that the GPU code and CPU code all lives in the same source file, okay? But what does it mean to have a multi-compilation model? You might not have heard of that, and it's not the meaning you normally think it is. So here's a single compilation model, okay? You, uh, you've seen this before, in a, in a single source, single compilation model, okay? In a single compilation model, um, effectively, you look at that, okay? And it's, a, it's basically, sorry, let me, what happened here? This is, this is effectively the same host and device compiler, they, meaning that it's, it might be different compilers, but they come from the same vendor, and you control both the host and the, the GPU compiler. When you can control that, you have a lot of flexibility, because there's a lot of ABI concerns across the boundary that you can communicate with each other with, okay, that you might not normally be able to tell, okay? 
And when they have that capability, the, probably the best example is, is NVIDIA's NVCC, okay? They control both the, the, the CPU compilation and the GPU compilation, okay? So it's a single source host and device compiler. This is tied to effectively a single comp compilation chain. Now this is what almost everyone in the world is familiar with. Most of you guys are probably familiar with that, where you get your, 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 um, your front end and the back end from the same um, vendor, okay? You might imagine, why would I ever want to get it from different people? Well, you do. If you want to be able to, for instance, swap out to a different GPU between um, development and production, okay? In a single compilation model, it's pretty good because you have, you know, if you have a C++ source file, you, you know, you could take that um, C++ source file and you could take some AMP code and compile it through the AMP compiler. If you have some CUDA code, you could go through the CUDA compiler, some OpenMP code, go into an OpenMP compiler, and each one of these would generate a different target. It's exactly what you kind of want. Three different compilers, Three different executables, three different um, outputs, okay? Now, Sickle is entirely standard C++. That means that it doesn't have any of these things that identifies it as going to um, the GPU or CPU global. It doesn't have pragmas, okay? It doesn't have um, the, what did I cross out? Restrict, <laughs> okay? And so this is Sickle. It entirely looks like C++. Um, it's a library call to say this goes to the parallel four for this vector class add for this range, okay? Go into this index, and here's the kernel calculation that you're gonna blast through some, some vector SIMD, okay? And it targets a wide range of devices, that's great. But because it targets a wide range of devices, what if you wanna swap an APU for a GPU after the compilation, okay? For that, you need what's called a multi-compilation model. In a multi-compilation model, you have a SQL device compiler, which is compiling the, um, the code to the GPU and generating what's called the SPEAR, which is the um, OpenCL intermediate um, language. Um, so the CPU compiler could be just anything, Clang, GCC, Visual C++, Intel C++. Hopefully, you can select, what you want to do is get to a point where you can select the device at runtime, okay? This is where, it's, this is where I want to stretch your mind. This is, where, this is the reality of the, the programming world, the embedded programming world, okay? You want to be able to select the device at runtime, okay? Now, the standard IR will give you better, better performance portability, not, not perfect, but there you go. Now, Sickle doesn't have to use Spear. And indeed, you could use it to program PTX. And as long as your linker can, can figure this out, then the PTX binary can be selected for NVIDIA GPUs at runtime using this um, finalizer, okay? So that's the, the real trick with this, because what it means is that now you divorce yourself from having the same CPU compiler and necessarily the same device compiler all the time. See, NVIDIA can do it because they're only supporting NVIDIA chips. Go ahead. The, the finalizer, is this part of the XP? XP? No, no. The finalizer um, picks which one, uh, well, it's part of the ICD um, construct that's, that the vendor supplies, but no. See, this is, a, this is a reason why you, don't, you, you kind of want to go to a world where you don't have one, per, one, one company controlling the entire compilation chain. Um, if you can move to this particular world, you can effectively now have um, swap in a PTX runtime or a SPEAR runtime, um, depending on what you need. Um, what you do have, though, is this effect of fat binary, though, because the binary has to contain all these images. Alex? Right. 
Right. So the question is, um, can you disambiguate um, between with a function that calls some other function? Can you have a specialized version for, for FPGA, um, a specialized version for APUs? Is that the question? Right, so that you, it's not a, it's not a compile time property. It's like a, it's, it's, it's directed through a runtime property, yeah. Um, so we're working on something like that in the next release, okay? Uh, the questions, and go ahead. This model correctly that suppose I have my usual box, which is, which has an Intel i7 mm -hmm. with the Intel HD, which is not used for display or anything. Yeah. But for the rest of the body, I have, I have a dis discrete uh, NVIDIA GT something. Mm -hmm. I run this, and it will discover the combined set of, of, of my not used uh, Intel GPU and, and, and whatever it's like right. of, of, of memory, so the, and it will use all of them. So the question is, if I have a box that have a multiple sets of GPU devices, yeah. diff, and, and then we call them different types now, not like you know um, NVIDIA 960 versus 11, they're, they're, they're within the same ISA, yeah. but they're different ISAs. And can you um, load balance them so that you can actually make yeah, use? That, that would be even That's exactly what it's going to be beneficial for. Because you effectively have code in here for all of these guys that you compile for, and now you can effectively do load balancing on these things. <laughs> so how does SICL support different ways of representing parallelism? Well, of the choices that I gave from the design discussion, we use explicit parallelism, meaning we don't use pragmas. We use queuing. Okay, there's a queue which you can queue up kernels. That way allows you to intercede in the queue. HSA uses a similar queuing model. Um, and we support both tasks and data parallelism. That last part is not that, 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 that mind blasting because every, almost everybody supports tasks and data parallelism. You probably couldn't get into the game if you, you didn't. All right, so um, I don't know what I was trying to show there. <laughs> but let's take a look at the data movement. Um, this is where SQL uses what's called the implicit model. Um, SQL separates the storage and the access of data and can specify where the data should be stored and allocated and creates an atomic, uh, automatic data dependency graph. So the way this works is that it, you don't have to tell it explicitly where that data needs to be or what needs to move to the GPU. It uses a set of essentially very much C++ buffer and accessors to control the concurrency of this particular data. So basically, the buffer manages the data access across, um, um, across host to device. And there are these accessors, which, tells, which gives you, tells you what kind of access is it. Is it a read access or write access or both? Okay. And then now you can have a different accessor for the CPU, a different one for the GPU, and a different, even though they use the same buffer, because you might want the data to be um, doing computation at a different, different time. Um, or it might be feeding from the, the GPU to the CPU. So one is a read and one is a write, okay? The buffers and the accessors are type safe because we're using a single source compilation model, okay? And the accessors will allow you to specify where you want your data to be stored or allocated on the device. So if it's a global type of accessors, it's gonna go into global memory. Um, if it's a constant accessor, it goes into, GPUs have these things for constant memory because they use constants a lot and they have a specific memory for that. Um, so they're only in what's called read-only memory. Then you also have local accessors for the local scratch pad memory, okay? <coughs> so SICL is uses what these dependency call graphs to resolve concurrency uh, arbitration, like competing demands on the same buffer of data and if you know what the, whether it's a read access or write access, you have a much more efficient way of scheduling these things. So for instance, you have some, a bunch of buffers. These are like vectors, some vectors, some data, some arrays. That's typically what you move around. Or maybe an image or something like that. Maybe that image has a pedestrian in it and you need to stop your car. Then you also have these kernels which are doing processing and computation on these things and trying to give you some information like stop your car, okay? So the, the accessors allow you to specify the access pattern. So from buffer A and buffer B, I might have a read accessor and a write accessor for the kernel. 
um, similar for a, buffer A and C. And then I might want to take in all these data, data except buffer A for the kernel C, okay? And out of that, then I can say, I can abstract out what needs to, um, I can abstract out that kernel C is feeding into kernel A and B. This is the call graph dependency I have abstracted out based on what you told me in code about whether somebody is reading or writing some data. So this is why the data dependency graph is built in, is built into the runtime. You don't have to figure this stuff out. You probably did anyway in order to create the commands to figure out whether it's a read or write access. Okay, so what does the SQL code look like? So I have to, you know, it is Kronos group stuff, so I have to plaster these kinds of advertising about it. Yes, they have a lot of members. They're a very rich organization. But they've been developing, obviously, they, they, but, but honestly, they have been the experts at heterogeneous programming for quite a long time. But they're not the only ones, right? I mean, OpenMP, HSA, NVIDIA, they're all, they're all experts. So like I said, this is not a problem that we have to invent the solution for, okay? All right, enough advertising. Let's do, a ve let's do a vector add in SQL. So you include some header, and you can see this is a fully templated library for vector addition. And here's where I basically annotate the buffer with the accessor data as to whether I'm taking, uh, with, with, sorry, no, I haven't gone to it. This is just setting the buffer for the, um, for the input, for the input vector A, B, and the output vector. And then the buffer is synchronized upon destruction later on, so a lot of that is, is automatic. Then I queue it, okay? And then I add, this is the kernel. I submit it to the queue, and this is the, the code that's gonna be compiled uh, by the GPU com device compiler and executed on the GPU. It's gonna create a command group to define what's called an asynchronous task. Asynchrony in GPU computing is probably the one of the most important aspects at getting you performance. Synchronized, synchronized execution is basically a dead end. Now here's the access, accessors. In the accessor, I specifically tell you whether I'm gonna do a read or read or write of the different buffers. And then from there, I do my computation. And in this particular case, I do a parallel for loop um, for defining the device code. I have to do this tricky thing called naming the lambda and the reason I do that is because lambda kernel expressions are, uses a non-standard layout type. That's a problem, because if I am trying to pass this lambda kernel from the host to the GPU, the GPU has to figure out what the layout is on this thing. Don't forget, the GPU compiler can be a different compiler. If it's the same compiler, it's no problem. I know what layout you, you're gonna give because you know, we're the same company, we're friends. But we're not friends. <laughs> we don't know what the layout is, so I have to name the kernel to be able to figure out, um, reverse engineer what that layout is going to be. Okay? We really wish that lambdas were standard layout types, but they're not. Um, but now the ranges TS gives us another, another way of solving that problem because there are some, range, there are some ranges that are standard layouts. Okay? Um, there's the computation kernel. Um, basically um, adding the two input vectors and doing the computation out in parallel. Now you might ask, well, this all looked like library code. Oh yeah, it is, it sure is. This is a call graph handler which calls a, a, a structure within the SQL um, header, and, and that, is a, that is a library call. But some library calls can be masqueraded as compiler magic. So those library calls are actually intercepted by the front end, the Clang front end, and the Clang front end does the computation, okay? Um, otherwise, the rest of this is all very straightforward C++ code. We have to write, make sure that the Clang compiler can understand the fact that the, this kernel, this lambda kernel has a name, a name, this is a name lambda kernel, so that we can effectively pass it between um, the ABI uh, compatible between the host and the device. If you, are, if you control the whole compilation chain, you don't need that because you know what the ABI will be. If you don't control the whole compilation chain, you have to solve that C++ problem. Then you do the vector addition using some calling code from, from some main or some higher level function, and that's it. Okay, um, let me see how much time I have. Four o'clock, I'm gonna stop here because 
<laughs> you kind of already got it already. The rest of this is showing a talk I gave at CPPCon where I demonstrated using the parallel algorithm, which, you, which is designed for CPU, but, I, but we, we recast it using Sickle for GPU. And I'll show you quickly. Um, we got an amazing speed up on GPUs where if you have enough um, um, iteration so that the move, data movement isn't swamped by the computation, remember that problem I talked about? Look at the amazing, look at the speed up here. Um, we're just running sort um, and a bunch of um, using, this is the sequential policy, so it's done sequentially just on the CPU. Okay, 1.48. Then you use the parallel and vectorized, it's not that much better, 1.0. Then you now do it on the GPU and it's 0.399. Okay, almost four or five times faster on the GPU. People were just totally amazed at the CPP con, and they really, really want this now. The reason we, are, we do this is um, the, the parallel, um, um, parallel um, STL algorithm, um, sorry, C17 parallel algorithm, gives you this escape clause that says if you create your own policy, you can do pretty much what you want. So instead of using PAW, sequential, PAW, or unseek, we, we, you have to feed in the sickle execution policy, which effectively says goes to the GPU. And that's a permitted escape clause. All right, so remind you, using the proper abstractions for C++ 2327, heterogeneous programming isn't gonna be here for C++ 20. Where I've taken you on a long journey, you learn a lot, you learn what are the problems of heterogeneous programming, you learn the history of it, you learn how it looks for many, many different languages that are supporting it already. And this is what we're gonna to try to do in C++ 20. You're, gonna get, get, you're probably gonna get vectors in C++ 20, you'll, you'll get these things in 20, but you won't get um, the um, heterogeneous, but it will likely come in some sort of um, TS or something. Um, 796 is now working on affinity. Um, 443 is working on executors. And 772 is working on TLS. And 797 is now working on ex exception handling. And these will have a better chance of going into 23 um, if we can make that happen. Finally, expose more parallelism, and increase locality of reference. Remember those two things as you move forward in your programming career. Thank you very much. <laughs>